Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Bridget Anderson, and with me is David Morgan from The Morgan Report. You can see him online at silver-investor.com. Last time I saw you was one year ago. It was January 2012. You were really bullish on silver. Do you think you were too enthusiastic? Looking back, I was. Uh, basically, I went back and reviewed uh, the charts, really, uh, for the big run-up in 2011, where it basically went from $26 to about 48 in a matter of weeks. And I realized, you know, I was too enthusiastic that it's going to take about a year and a half, maybe two years to work off that kind of a move. And, and why is that? Well, markets go from undervalued to fair value to overvalued. Temporarily, silver was overvalued in that momentum play. There were like four or five margin increases uh, for silver at that higher level, above 40, for the market to cool off. And so once it cooled off, it went down drastically. Once that happens, you have a spike high. I know from experience and study that it takes a long time. It's called overhead supply. And what that means is that people that bought it at 40 or 42 or let's say 38 in the area or higher are now at a loss when it hits 33. Well, most people don't accept a loss, not easily. So they'll wait for it to come back to 33 and they'll sell and say, well, I broke even. And that overhead supply for everybody at 33 that wants to sell has to be worked off. And then it moves up to the next level, let's say it's 35. And everybody that's disheartened with silver after a year and a half or two years says, oh my goodness, it's 35, I'm gonna yeah. sell it, I never wanna talk about silver again, I can't <laughs> stand it. And that overhead supply is worked off. And so it goes until you get back to the new high. And once you hit above 48, then everyone has sold it, and not everyone, but some people say, oh my goodness, did you hear about the silver story? It's so great, I can hardly wait to get back into the silver market. So people do psychologically the opposite yeah. a lot of the time of what they should do. So right what's now, the silver yeah. story now for 2013? The silver story right now is going to be a good year, not a great year. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be above 40. I also think we may get lucky enough to test the $48 level mm -hmm. a couple times. I don't think we've got enough juice in the market in 2013 to sustain it over the $48 level for any significant amount of time. But there's been a curveball thrown in the market as far as I'm concerned, and that's this Bundes Bank situation where the Germans want their gold back. And all of a sudden, people are waking up to, well, maybe these gold nuts that say, you know, gold is in short supply and it's not as plentiful because it's been hypothecated and rehypothecated, and there's all this paper gold out there and derivatives golds are plentiful, but physical gold isn't. All this stuff that we kind of get painted with this big, broad brush that we don't know what we're talking about, all of a sudden is making a lot of sense. Germany can't get their gold back for seven years. How absurd is this? So maybe they aren't wrong after all. Maybe they're not wrong after all. And what would be the impact of that if those people, and we're talking about the people mostly from GATA and those kinds of uh, groups, what would be the impact if they weren't wrong? And in fact, they are right. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine, but I'm not shy at voicing my opinion. I think it could be significant. I mean, if the New York Times gets the story even half right, and some of these sleepy North Americans wake up, I'm not talking about people at the show, I'm talking about the other people, uh, they might grasp the concept that, well, there's a reason, first of all, there's a reason why Germany wants to go back. Secondly, there's something wrong if they can't get it back in a timely manner. And lastly, they would start to investigate their own questions surrounding that dynamic, and maybe they'd reach a conclusion that, you know what, paper money isn't the place to be, or savings at a zero interest rate isn't really good for me, or whatever the conclusion they draw, I think it's going to put a lot more pressure into the metal. So because of that, it's harder for me to predict what's going to happen in silver and gold this year. It's a, it's a wild card, so to speak. And as far as gold, are there other things that you're watching besides what's happening in Germany? Absolutely. I mean, we're looking at, you know, not only the shows, looking at sentiment overall, what mm -hmm. people's feelings are. We're looking at the geopolitical scene. I'm really not favorable to any political group. Uh, I'm libertarian. but. The problem is that you've got to look at the real world the way it exists. And, you know, this thing with the, the gold and the German thing could turn into a currency crisis. I mean, it could be currency wars or something started. I don't know. I don't want to get negative, but I'm well studied on the topic. And what could happen is a bit scary because then there could be trade barriers set up. Like Germany says, well, if we don't get enough of our gold back by this time, then we're going to put a ha, tariff on any goods coming from the United States. And other countries say, yeah, you know, we're gonna side with Germany. Why are they doing that? Well, because you guys aren't giving them their gold back. So I'm just projecting possibilities. Am I saying it's going to happen? No, what I am saying is 
it's a great area of concern when you've got these international trade settlements that aren't being rectified, again, in a, in a manner that you would expect. I mean, the U.S. broke its contract with the world August 15th, 1971, January 21st, 1980. Gold goes from the fixed price of 42.22 an ounce to 850 on the spot market. I mean, once it was released from government control, even with management, it made a huge move, like 2,500%. So I think we're going to see that again this time, and we're not there yet. No question there are some interesting times ahead, definitely on that front. Let's leave that for now, because we could hypothesize forever about what's going to happen there. And let's talk a little bit about the junior miners. So, you know, there's no question, 2012 was a volatile year. So what are you seeing for 2013? And, and for investors, you know, where should they be uh, looking for the opportunities, and how? I think it's going to be more of the same. I mean, you know, I know that... Um, I get to speak freely here. Really, I'm not that favorable to the junior sector right now. The market moves in cycles. The main cycle of the junior explorers was really, really the right place to be between early 2000 and say 2006 or seven or so. Right now, you really want to be in companies that have growth availability due to the fact that they're producing and they have good margins. And even at the today's prices that are okay, but not really where they should be, that they can either increase production or maintain. It, you could look selectively at some you know, speculative companies. I always do. I'm here for that reason, mm -hmm. among others. But it's tough pickings because it's very difficult to find capital to invest in these smaller companies now. Those days are pretty much over. So I yeah. focus on where is the money going. It's going to the mid-tiers and the top tiers. There will be a time in the future when the market is hot again where that sector will become red hot. And I know that's going to happen. But Do I don't think this, term, not in the near term, no. I don't see that happening this year. Again, I could be wrong with this wild card we talked about. Okay, I want to switch gears and I want to ask you about a piece that you wrote about um, Generation Y and the challenges that that generation has, because you had some interesting things to say when it comes to Gen Y and the baby boomers. So first off, just fill us in a little bit about your thinking on that. Well, first of all, I think it's kind of like my era going back when I was like a teenager in my early 20s, you know, don't trust the establishment. I think this Generation Y is like very leery. They know that the political class has basically lied to them. They don't know what's real. I think a lot of them are using stuff and not owning it. You know, they'd rather like rent a cell phone or throw it away or rent a mm -hmm. car and use it or rent a bicycle there in a new city or take public transportation. I think they're very wise about that. You know, this materialism that has per been so pervasive through the baby boomer, boomer generation, which I'm a part of. I think Generation Y has rethought that whole thing. It's something that we use. It's not something we own. The more stuff that, that we own, the more it weights us down. I'm not as mobile. I'm not as free when I have all this stuff. So that's one thing. The other thing is I think they're looking for truth seekers. I think generally the Generation Y is looking to find the truth. And there aren't many people in the mainstream press that have anything to say that isn't really, really slanted or painted with an orientation or an outcome or direction. So the propaganda press, as I call it, they've given up on that. Most of those people are looking at the Internet for information. Internet's great, but it's totally free market, which means mm -hmm. you've got to be, you know, you You're on use, the Internet. I'm on the Internet all the time. And so you but can say what you think. And, I can say yeah. what I think, but you also got to, you know, Believe me or not, in other words, do your own due diligence, you know, yeah. weigh it against what you really know, because, you know, it's free, which means you got to use some discretion when you listen to anyone, including myself. But having said that, I think there's a lot more great information available on the Internet that you'll ever get from the mainstream press. And it's being able to sift through that and to be able to discern, you know, what the noise is and, you know, where the real quality gems are, right? And I'm favorable to Generation Y. I think they are, I think their expectations are pretty realistic. I mean, it's the first time, I think it was the New York Times, I don't want to misquote it, that said, you know, that generation's expectations are that their living standards will not be as great as their parents were. Mm -hmm. Well, what is that? Is that based on materialism only? Maybe they're going to be more spiritual. Maybe they're going to be more giving. Maybe they're going to be more empathetic. Maybe they're going to be more compassionate. Maybe they're going to be more human. I mean, these are things of real value, but no one ever talks about that. You know, I think those are important things to get across. Mm -hmm. And that was why I did some of those films I did. Like the Matrix is all about going down the rabbit hole so deep that you understand yeah. what's really important. 
I mean, you just don't want to get inundated with commercialism all your life and advertising agencies that tell you how to live your life. Are you kidding me? A reality show? Are you kidding me? I mean, you've got to have your own life. I mean, people ask me, have you seen this? I don't have time. I have a life. I don't have time to watch some reality show. So Come some on. hope for the, the Gen Y then in 2013. I'm sorry? So some optimism. You Absolutely. Know, yeah. You know, I think, yeah. you, know, be, you know, first of all, love what you have. Most people in the North American continent have a very great life. They just don't know it because they don't travel like I do. To go out and see what the third world looks like, to see what these people actually deal with on a daily basis. They're in this, you know, boob tube mentality, looking at what the TV's telling them their life should be like, instead of what their life really is compared to something else. So, you know, I get a little irate about it. You can tell I'm passionate, passionate. about that as well. We'll, we'll call it passionate, okay. not irate. And always interesting. Thanks so much, David. My pleasure.